Hello, everyone. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Naomi Schaefer Riley. I'm a senior fellow here. Um, I specialize in child welfare, uh, AEI, for those of you who are not familiar with it. Um, we're a think tank, but we are very committed to finding solutions to the most um, to the problems that affect the most vulnerable members of our society. And um, kids in foster care are certainly uh, fall into that category. I am thrilled to be joined today by Mark Daly. Um, Mark and I first got in contact a few years ago. We are, between the two of us, not entirely sure how. Um, but Mark became a member of a working group here that I have uh, that talks about child welfare. We're a bipartisan group of about two dozen members of uh, researchers, judges, former agency heads, nonprofit leaders um, who get together and talk about the most pressing issues in the world of child welfare. And Mark has been an uh, invaluable contribution to that effort. Um, so I was very excited to learn that um, his book and his story were finally going to come out. Um, Mark, as many of you know, is a social activist and entrepreneur and a foster turned adoptive father. Um, he has over two decades of experience in message development, communication strategy, and public policy, including, and this is a special one for AEI, as a communications director and spokesperson for then Senator Hillary Clinton. Um, I think that child welfare actually is a pretty bipartisan issue and there's room for a lot of agreement across the aisle on this issue, um, which is why I've been so grateful um, to have Mark's help in the work that we have done as part of the working group, um, but also grateful for his friendship too. So please help me welcome Mark. Um, so we're going to start. Mark's going to read a little bit from his book, and then I'm going to ask him some questions. Uh, and then when we are done, we're going to open it up the last 15 minutes for questions from the audience. So be prepared for those. <laughs> I just want to first say thank you all for coming, and thank you, Naomi and AEI, for having me. This is It's so special to be here and to see so many friends from so long ago when I lived here. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. OK. This is, um, just to, to give you a little context too, this is actually from the first chapter. It's, we were in our foster parent training, my husband and I were, when this was taking place. So it says, as a gay man, I never had to worry about an unplanned pregnancy, morning sickness, or the lifetime of responsibilities that go along with having a child. I could brunch, blissfully unaware of the hours-long dance recital at the theater on the corner, sipping mimosas while parents reapplied sunblock at soccer games in the park. I never had a pregnancy scare force me to ponder important questions like, am I ready to be a parent? What does it mean to be one? What makes a good parent, or even an acceptable one? There are only a few roads leading to parenthood for couples like Jason and me, surrogacy, private adoption, or foster to adopt. I don't recall exactly when we first talked about our options, but I'd always assumed we'd foster adopt a child at some point. Three of my cousins had come into our family uh, through foster care, and I consulted for a few child welfare nonprofits. Which, which gave me some familiarity with how many children across the country were in need of foster homes. I knew that over four million children come to the attention of child welfare agencies each year on concern of abuse or neglect. And that on any given day, roughly 120,000 children are waiting to be adopted. In California, one in five children entering foster care were babies under the age of one. And that is what we wanted, a baby. We didn't care about race or gender, Give us a boy or a girl or one whose gender would be determined later in life. None of that mattered. We were in love and we had two big, loud, supportive families and a huge community of friends in our corner. I'd skipped into the first of four intensive foster parent training sessions like Belle in the opening scene of Beauty and the Beast, one hand clasping my husband's and the other tightly wrapped around a Starbucks. Bonjour, good day. We were newlyweds, living our fairy tale. And like the heroes at the beginning of every classic quest, we were excited and naive. Our love for one another and desire to grow a family overshadowed the truth of what we just signed up to do. Well, for those of you who haven't read the book, I mean, I'm trying not to give too many spoiler alerts, but let's just say uh, Mark and Jason learned a lot about the system uh, from this experience. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to just sort of start by asking you a little bit about what your expectations really were. What did you, even once you, you know, you had had some familiar with the foster care system, and even once you went through the trainings, um, what did you expect? I think, you know, in, in so much of my work, I've heard stories about the children in foster care, but also, you know, we wanted to start our family with a baby. And I'd heard stories of moms who had 
you know, stepped outside of the maternity ward to smoke a cigarette and didn't return and left the children. And, and that was sort of what we wanted. I thought that we could, if we asked the right questions when they called, we could increase our odds of getting sort of this case of a child that needed parents, you know? So um, let's fast forward. <laughs> Two children, uh, you, you, you finish the training, you pass with flying colors. Um, <laughs> Two children were brought to your home. Um, tell us a little bit about them um, and what you kind of immediately realized were some of the problems with your original perceptions about foster care. Yeah. You know, when, when, I'll give you a little backstory too. When they had come to our house to look at it, they, you know, they have to do a home inspection to make sure it's safe. And they had come through the house and they walked around and the woman that was there was lovely as could be. And she was from Boston, like me, with a super thick accent. So I, you know, loved her immediately. And she said at the end of it, she's like, "Mac, you know, we have this. We, we sometimes, you know, we get more than one. Like, would you know, would you consider siblings?" And I totally didn't understand what she was saying. I thought what she meant was, if the mom has a baby three years down the road, can we call? And we'd always talked about having, you know, more than one. So we're like, "Yeah, sure, totally." And my husband looked at me like I had nine heads. He's like, "Are you joking?" And then, of course, fast forward to like, they call and they're like, yeah, we have two kids. They're three months old and 13 months old. Brothers, would you take them? And you know, then we started asking them questions and trying to figure out like, what was the likelihood of them going back or not? And you know, because the goal of, of foster care is reunification. And we certainly support reunification, but as I mentioned before, there are kids that likely aren't gonna go home. And if we could have gotten that, we would have rather you know, start our family immediately. And so we asked a bunch of questions, and the odds seemed to be in the favor of them not going home with the little information they provided. So we said yes. So tell us a little bit about the little bit of information you're provided. Um, in some ways, you know, the experience that these two children had was pretty typical um, in the sense that most of the kids who come into foster care are there as a result of neglect. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a lot of different ideas about what, what neglect means. What did it mean in the case of these two children who were brought to you? And you know, did that sort of impact your understanding of what foster care was? Yeah, you know, I think it's one of the challenges I saw with foster care is that there really isn't a clear definition of neglect, right? Like what may look like neglect to some may look like a parent struggling with poverty to others. And so it's just a difficult thing to assess. In our situation, you know, there was a drug exposure situation with, with the younger child. And so then it became sort of this investigation that was launched from there. And then when they got to the house and they saw the condition of where they were living, they were living with, with grandparents and a home that, you know, had cat feces on the floor or dog feces on the floor. You know, they were sleeping on a mattress. The entire family was on the mattress. There was just a whole lot going on there. It was untreated mental health, a bunch of issues. And so that was really what the, led the decision for them to be detained in the first place. Mm. Um, so you had this sort of uh, quick education um, <laughs> into how to care for very small children. Um, did the kids have trouble kind of adjusting, trusting you at first? What was this like for all of you? Well, I mean, I think I had the biggest adjustment because, you know, you, when you're bringing a baby home from the hospital, like, you've had this time to prepare. You know you're pregnant. You know what to expect. You know the size the baby's going to be, you know, these things. But when you're in foster care and you say, we'll accept a child that's, you know, zero to three years old, that could be any size. That could be, you know, what size diapers do you buy? What, what you know, what's a swaddle? Like, you know, all these different questions that run through your head. And so, you know, we really... We had a crib. We had the, the major things, but it was like we didn't know what size diapers to buy before they arrived or like what kind of formula they used or if they even used formula at that point, right? Um, but the boys, you know, they went, the younger one was a little malnourished when he got there, uh, and we found out the mother had been mixing like one scoop instead of four scoops or something. Like, you know, what the ratio was off in that what she was using in the formula. And then the older one was 36 pounds at 13 months, um, which is just a larger kid. I mean, just, you know, and he was um, just a bundle of energy. It was hysterical. But he would, um, he would have these, some of the things he would do, like he would just walk around the house yelling, snack, snack, snack. And it was like sort of his, it, what, we, what we learned with the, the help of the therapist is like that was sort of a response that he was having because there were times in his life where he had food and times where he didn't. 
And so he just always wanted it when he thought it was something they could have. It became like a comfort thing for him to know that he had it. So we had to work really hard to, to set up you know, a structure for him that he knew he was always going to have food, but that it was more scheduled and routine and you know, to try to deal with that. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about sort of your interactions with um, the caseworkers who came to visit you initially and then sort of talk about you know, just the different employees of, you know, you were, you were doing this through Los Angeles, mm-hmm. um, through Los Angeles' DCS um, that interacted with you um, you know, maybe a little bit about the kind of variance in quality of the employees who, who you dealt with, um, and, you know, just how you felt um, you were treated, uh, you know, as foster parents by the system. What, what role did the professionals see you having in this? Yeah, and I would say, and I want to preface my answer too, there's disclaim, the disclaimer with, like, it was different with each person, you know, we worked with, we, in Los Angeles, you can contract with a nonprofit to go, you can get certified through a nonprofit that then contracts with the county. So we did that. Our experience with the nonprofit was amazing. I mean, the reason that they recommend you do that is because you get this social worker who comes to your house weekly and there's much more hand-holding. And I, I needed my hand held and I had a lot of questions. I'm, I'm definitely a squeaky wheel. I mean, I wrote a book. So, you know, definitely a squeaky wheel. But it was, I needed that. So they provided that, they were exceptional. The county, we had a couple of different social workers. And the, the first social worker we had, you know, she was very professional, very buttoned up, very, she was, I mean, great by all accounts. She had 45 cases, which I thought was insane that she had that many. I mean, think about it, you have 30 days in a month, that's including weekends, and she has to go to visit every single child during that month, file reports. All, I'm like, how do you do this? I mean, LA is not, I mean, well, it's like DC, you know, I mean, you're going, 10 miles can take you an hour sometimes, you know, plus in, in LA. And so I was just, I marveled at how much she did with that. But then we were transferred to another one that was just sort of, um, she was a nightmare for us to deal with. And then, you know, there were times like where she would schedule visits at our house at the same time that she would schedule for her to be meeting with the birth parents or the kids would have a visit with the birth parents and she would schedule herself to come here. And it was just, you couldn't, we couldn't get through to her. You know, she ended up that she had 13 cases we found out. Um, you know, so she was probably on probation. We weren't allowed to email her without CCing her supervisor. Um, and really when it stood out the most to me, because as frustrated as I was with it, there was a time where we were talking to the birth mother and she said, yeah, you know, she's like, she's really difficult to work with. She said, the other day she sent me to a 7-Eleven. I was supposed to get drug tested. She sent me the wrong, you know, she gave me the address for a 7-Eleven. And I was thinking this whole time, I'm like, you know, like we have jobs and cars and friends and nannies and babysitters and all these people that we can lean on. And this woman doesn't have any of that. Like it must've been so much harder for her, you know? Um, it's interesting you, t- you talk a lot in the book about your interactions with the birth parents. Um, you know, foster care, the system used to be much more reluctant to have foster parents really have any contact yeah. with birth parents, and that's changed a lot over the last number of years. Um, can you talk a little bit about your interactions with the birth parents, um, you know, both in terms of your feelings, but also kind of in terms of the information that was giving you about the kids? Yeah. You know, they didn't, the, the system is sort of designed to protect their privacy. And it, and it should be, right? Like, just because you have some of these kids doesn't give you, you know, courtside seats to their life, right? You shouldn't be able to sit there and, um, and, and weigh in on what's going on. But that being said, you know, the birth parents in our situation had three hours of visitation three times a week was what the court had ordered. And we're responsible for transporting them, supervising, all that stuff. Now, that is basically a full-time job when you factor in, you know, where they lived versus where we lived and the traffic and so on and so forth. They, they seldom took that time, but when they did, you know, they, we're the only ones that can talk. So we're having a conversation with them. We're talking about the kids, and then they just start opening up, and they tell you, you know, about their life and the stuff they've gone through. And I think, for me, you know, I expected that they didn't have the, the rosy upbringing that I had, but I, I think I was blown away by how much they had endured, in particular the mother, um, you know, which she had lost her mother when she was young, she was raised by her grandmother who was mourning and struggling with poverty and some other issues. And then, you know, there was just so many other things that weighed in on top of the, this, this, the, her, her mental health issues that were untreated, um, so many other issues that were going on that made it really hard. And 
part of, you know, as you were saying, like the system allows you to have more access to it. One of the things they're doing in California now, which I really love, because I've gotten to sit in on some of them since um, they started implementing this, it's called the Child and Family Team. And the idea is that as soon as a kid comes into care within 30 days, there's like a roundtable meeting of the birth parents, the foster parents, an aunt, uncle, grandmother, any, like, any caring adult in this person's life, the therapist, the teacher, the soccer coach, whatever it is, they get together and they sit around. And the idea is there, how do we figure out the plan to support reunification and so on? And I think had we had that from the start, it might have been like our, our dynamic would have been different too, you know, because you're, you're, you don't want to root on anyone to fail. You know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about class. Um, you mentioned that you know there is this issue where, um, and I think our, our mutual friend Ron Richter, who used to be the head of the Administration for Children's Services in New York, said this to me once. Um, they really prefer foster parents who don't have jobs um, because it's very easy to say, "We'll be at your house tomorrow at 10 a.m. <laughs> and someone will be there." Um, un unfortunately, when you do that, often you preclude a lot of middle and upper middle class people from doing fostering um, because you are sort of just expecting them to drop everything at the drop of a hat for you know whatever schedule the caseworker and and maybe the caseworker mm -hmm. is obviously under a lot of pressure too. Um, but it becomes very difficult to sort of you know have a typical middle class life with two working parents. Yeah. Um, you know if you're going to administer to sometimes what seem like the whims of the foster family. Um, so I think you've gotten some criticism for this, you know, um, you know, that you have, you know, swooped in with all of your, you know, white privilege, mm -hmm. um, and, and have, you know, taken these kids under your, uh, you know, under your care. Um, you know, what is your response to that? Should we have more people who are middle and upper middle class, you know, doing foster care? Or, you know, does that sort of imply a certain, like, you know, whatever you want to call it, the rescue mentality, um, uh, in the, in the equation? You know, when you say the rescue mentality, I hope that it does mean rescue the, the system and that. And, and what I mean by that is like, look, my way of giving back was to try to write this book to raise awareness around all of the different pieces that I saw that were broken in the system. Like, there are some really good elements to it as well. I mean, there's nothing better than watching a family who's struggling with addiction recover and, and get their life back together. That's a good thing. You know, when we have rehab facilities that let parents bring their children so that the children don't endure the trauma of moving in with strangers, that's a good thing, right? But there is, when it, when, you know, when it comes to the, the issue of class, like, you know, you're, there was a blog post that kind of took me down on this, but th it is this idea that, you know, I think you need more voices and from all walks of life at the table, right? Um, shortly after we had done the, after, you know, our, well, I'm, without giving away the story here, there was a moment in time where we held a fundraiser for Senator Gillibrand from New York, which I guess I can say at AAI, right? Uh, but she was, in, and during her speech, she made a comment about, I have this parental leave camp program, and this is what my policy would do, blah, blah, blah. And, and it sounded great. I don't remember the ins and outs of it. But at the end of it, I went over to staff, and I was like, hey, you know, does that cover foster parents? And they said, yeah, it covers adoption. And I said, well, you know, when you adopt from foster care, typically you've had the kid somewhere between 18 and 24 months. So when you need that time off is when the kid moves in, not when they adopt. And the staffer looked at me and said, I don't know the answer to that, but tomorrow it will. And I was like, well, that's the best answer you could have given me. And I think that's what I mean by, like, we need people from all classes in this and from all walks of life because not everyone's going to be in that room to ask the senator to, to have her policy include foster kids, you know? Um, so I, I, we're trying not to do spoiler alerts, but I think we have to sort of say, <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> um, people who, you know, would see your family now yeah. might, might wonder exactly how things turned out. So, um, so those two children who came into your, mm -hmm. into your home, um, how long did they stay and tell us a little bit about what happened next? Sure. So the two boys moved in, went in with us. They were with us for about 15 months. And what happened was, um, after you know a hearing in court, the court had said, let's give them six more months with foster care. And at that point, we were still sort of like, I don't know if they should. The parents were making some progress, but not enough. And we were still worried, like, well, maybe six months will make a difference. Maybe it won't. I don't really know what it's going to look like. And just by sheer chance, my husband had signed up for this like court update system thing that sends out emails to tell you when there's been action on the case. And the mother had filed an appeal saying that the children never should have been detained in the first place. And so 
the day after we were in court, he received a notification saying she actually won her appeal and they would be going home. And so we, we tried to see, like, what, is that, what does that mean? What's going to, you know, is there, is someone going to appeal the appeal? I don't, you know, I don't know how it works. And so, but they ended up going home. And then we, we thought, um, well, let's wait and see. Let's stay in contact with them. Let's see what happens, you know, because they're going to come back into care. Like, they, they're not ready yet to go home. The parents aren't ready yet to care for them. What, and so, can, you, I just, can you describe, yeah. like, what, obviously you were having yeah. contact with the biological parents at this point. So what, what made you think that they weren't ready? Um, what were the signs that made you worry? Because as you say, you, you, in your, you know, in your, some version of your ideal world, yeah. you wanted these kids to, you know, have the happy ending, even if yeah. it meant that you and Jason were not going to have that happy ending. Absolutely. Um, and so what, what, what was it that made you, when you had interactions with their mother and father, um, think that this wasn't going to go well? Yeah, we had had very little. I mean, they, they used about 6% of the time allotted to them to actually see the parents, right? I have to see the kids. Anytime there was a meeting, a visit, they left early. They canceled it last minute. They just no-showed. I mean, there was just a lot of that. So I didn't feel like the kids even really knew who they were. I mean, the youngest was three months old when he came to live with us. He had no idea who his mother was. And she actually was rather indifferent to him. Like when we would have a visit... She just didn't pay attention to him. You know, she wouldn't hold him. She didn't want to look at him. There was just so many different things where we were like, this is, it was heartbreaking, you know, to, to see that. And she had also had a third child during this process as well, just to make it even more. So we were like, here's this woman who is going through so much. She was living in a rehab facility when she had the third child. It's like, just give her a little bit of space. You know, and that's what I think the judge had ruled, the one that had decided to let them stay for six more months. Um, but then the, the, the Circuit Court of Appeals said, or the appellate court I don't, said, no, they're going home now. And so how much notice did you have? Um, so it was about, I want to say it was maybe six weeks. But it wasn't like they didn't say on this date. It was one of those things where like immediately, you know, we we're in court and it was like the, the kids have an attorney, they're called Minors Council. The county has an attorney, DCFS has an attorney, and then each parent has an attorney. And it was pretty much unanimous that they should stay with us for six more months. Even the parents were kind of like, yeah, sure, you know. And then, you know, of course, the ruling came out. And then the next day, it was like, okay, so now we're going to give them unsupervised overnight visits. They're going to spend the weekend there. And we're like, wait, a day ago, you said they shouldn't have this. But because the other court ruled this way, they should? Like, it just, it was like, wait, I, we're, I think we're jumping the gun and racing this here. Like, we're, we get that they're going home, but we have to, you know, ease them into it and make sure that if they get there, they're going to be safe. And ultimately what happened was obviously they went back. I'm ruining the book for those of you who haven't read it, but it's worth the read, I promise. Read it anyway. Yeah. It, but, it, you know, they, um, there was a, there was an, we, we remained very close to them. You know, the mom was texting with my husband, you know, multiple times a day. We took them to the emergency room one night when one of them was sick. There's things like that. And then um, there was an incident where the mom had gone outside to smoke a cigarette and left the now 20-month-old, who was the younger child when we had him, and his 10-month-old younger sister alone in the bathtub when that happened. And so we, she, the grandmother found her, found them, notified us, and just, you know, after she had been kicked out of the house for telling her, this is not how you parent, you know. And um, we didn't know what to do. So we were like, I can't, you know, I would never be able to live with myself if, something happened and I didn't say something. But I also can't, you know, call this social worker because she's never responded to me anyways and hated me, you know, at this point. So I was a little bit too squeaky of a wheel. But there is, um, so just through my work, I'd happened to meet the head of LA County's DCFS and I knew he was a really good guy. And so I emailed him and just said, hey, I don't know what to do with this, but I need to tell somebody <laughs> you're in charge of everybody. So at least now it's on you and it's off me. Like, I'm going to sleep for the rest of my life. You might not be able to if you know. And he responded to me immediately and was just like, thank you for calling this to my attention. There'll be a new social worker there in the morning. And there was. And, you know, I mean, they just got more services, which is great. But she said, I never want to hear from you again, which is kind of what we knew would happen. And then, you know, about a year went by. And I woke up one day and I had a girlfriend who was finalizing her adoption. And I had helped her through her process of becoming a foster parent. And she sent me this text that said, you know, it may be too soon. I don't know what you're thinking about, but um, my adoption worker was over today. 
and she has these three kids that just got moved on to her caseload. There's no way they're going back to their birth parents. Um, would you guys be interested? And at this point, we'd already like started talking surrogacy again. We were going to go do that. So I mentioned it to my husband, and he was like, well, let's find out their story. I'm like, are you serious? So they moved in with us a few months later, and then we ultimately adopted them about a year and a half after that. Um, but 10 months after they moved into us, we got a call from the county, and they said the two boys and their younger sister were back in care. The mom abused them. Would you take them? And so it would have given us six children, and we ultimately said no, because that would have been a lot. But it was also the most difficult decision we've ever had to make. Mm. Um, and you can read all about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there'll be drinks afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so to bring this sort of back into the, the policy realm a little bit, I mean, you described a little bit of what the frustration that you had with the court system. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit a bit more about what the family court experience is like? I mean, your husband just happened to sign up for these text alerts. I mean, Otherwise, who knows how long it would have been before you found this out. But, <laughs> but just the, the first, you know, the times that you went in for these hearings, do you feel like the courts were getting complete information. What do you feel like was driving these decisions? Were people coming to court prepared for what was going to happen there? You are just teeing me up for this one here. <laughs> it was a mess, and I hope none of you I ever have, have to experience this. I have visited family court, so I know yep. the answer to these questions, but I want you to talk about it. So in L.A., like, you're sitting on this floor, and it's like this like L-shaped building room, and there's like courtrooms all along the side, and there are all these families just sitting there waiting, and you're told, arrive by 9.00 or maybe it was eight or I don't even know. And you pull up to this parking lot, and it's like, pay $7 in cash to park. And I was just thinking, I'm like, first of all, who carries cash? And then I'm like, it's just, it was like another thing where it was this whole, like, there was just so many things stacked against these families. So you get there, you're checked in through security, you're sitting down, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. You may not get called all day, or you might get called at 4.30. And if you leave to go get lunch, you might get called while you're doing that to go in. I'm thinking about, I'm like, I own my own company. My husband owns his own company. Like, we're fine. Like, we're, if we miss work, nobody cares. Nobody misses us. But, like, imagine if you're trying to get your children back, to, back and you've just started a new job two weeks ago, and now you have to go sit there and, and all day and wait for them to call you so that, you know, the judges and the lawyers and all them can get their stuff in a row for you. It's like, and, or, and not only that, but how humiliating is it to go to your boss and say, hey, I know I just started a week ago, but I need Tuesday off because I have to be in court to try to get my kids back. They, it, the system is just structured against these families. You know, and then there's all these people sitting there, and there's like some people with balloons that's clearly like set up for an adoption, and the other kids crying because they're seeing their parents for the first time. You know, there's so much stuff going on in that room while you're waiting. It's mind-blowing. But then you get in, and there's just stacks of folders of papers on these desks. And then everyone's like sort of scrambling to see, all right, the next case up is this and that. And it just didn't feel like it was anything. But there was one moment in particular that always stands out to me. The judge said, the, the parents sit down and you know, the lawyers are all like conferring and moving the paperwork and stuff. And the judge looks up and sees the two parents sitting there and they have the younger daughter at this point. You know? And the judge says, oh, who's this? And they said, oh, you know, this is our, our daughter. And he's like, oh, congratulations. I'm thinking, how did he not know? Like, so he's about to rule on, do they get the other two back? But he doesn't know that she's living in a rehab. He's in another rehab. They have a, they have a third child. Like, Nobody's told him what's going on, but he's going to make a decision in four minutes as to what happens with them. It just didn't seem right. But that's our judicial system. <laughs> yeah, it is. So, I mean, on the, other, on the other coast, I spent some time in New York family court, and it's very similar, you know, wait all day, see if you get called. Mm -hmm. And there were, you know, additional crazinesses, like one, uh, one judge that I sat in on his court uh, he does all of his own scheduling, like on the spot. So at the end of the hearing, he says, okay, um, can everybody come back two weeks from Tuesday? And then one lawyer says, I have a dentist appointment. And the other lawyer says, no, I can come back at like 2 o'clock, but not 3 o'clock. And this goes on for like 10 minutes. So you think these courts that are on the one hand completely overwhelmed and like every minute should be spent you know, figuring out what should be done with this kid. It's like, I compared it to someone, I said, it's like going to like your cardiologist and then scheduling your appointment with the cardiologist afterwards instead of like going 
going to the receptionist. But mm-hmm. but yeah, the, these I think the judicial system, the fam- family courts especially. Like I think yeah. you know they're you know we our criminals have right to speedy trials, but uh, the kids the children don't. not so much. You, there's parts of it I didn't even put in the book on like when we were um, finalizing our adoption, they we would have to go in for different times and we had to go to court a couple times. And there was, the first time we went in, they, the attorney came out beforehand and said, you know, look, it's probably going to get a continuance. And we said, well, why, why would they continue? He said, well, they're missing paperwork. And I said, well, what paperwork are they missing? And so he's like, oh, it's these five documents. I'll, I'll email them to you. And so while he emails them to me, and of course, I, I know to be there, I'm there all day. So I've got my laptop, I've got my hotspot going, I've been working the whole time we're sitting there. So I just start searching, I find four of the five documents, send them to him, and then he walks out, I'm like, hey, did you get the documents? He's like, yeah, but you know, we have, you know, there's one more missing, and so, you know, we're going to do the continuous. I'm like, how is that not, like, it, how is that not the case? And then, so then, of course, I started doing research. I'm kind of a nerd who Googles everything and then, you know, calls people like Naomi who actually know the real answers. But I found out, you know, in California at the time, the average cost was about $20,000 a month to have a child in foster care. So we had three kids. We got a three-month extension. So it cost $180,000 because people couldn't find paperwork. That money could have been better spent. Maybe digitizing the courts, but, you know. But I I did an informal survey of 15 families that had been post-termination of parental rights to see if they had experienced one, and all but three had, had 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 at least one continuance due to missing paperwork. So who do you think the system is set up for? (laughs) I I mean, the way it services people, it's the professionals that are involved. You know, I mean, it definitely, like it caters, and we have the same, the scheduling thing was the same exact way. It was, oh, no, I'm on vacation. Let's do it the next week. It, I mean, that was between the, the lawyers and the judge, you know, on that end. And what about the child welfare system as a whole? I mean, not just the judicial system. Here's the thing. So I always walk myself in a trap with these questions because it is, they're really, it's really political questions, right? I think that there is, you know, there's this thing with child welfare where as long as kids are being abused, we need a system. We, we need a system, and it needs to protect children, and it needs to put children first. And right now, I think the system doesn't necessarily put children first. Yeah. So there is this whole movement. I mean, there's a whole context here. There is a whole movement called the abolition movement, yeah. which is, you know, end child welfare. That, you know, the problem is really just poverty, and that if we sent out enough checks or other kinds of material support to these parents, the problem would be fixed. And you wouldn't need this, you know, what they call family surveillance system. Um, you know, what, how, how did we get here? You know, and, and, you know, and, and what is the response? I mean, you said, you know, as long as there are children who are abused. I mean, you, you've seen up close that there are real problems here mm-hmm. beyond that. Um, you know, but our, our child welfare conversation seems to be kind of going in, in you know, very opposite directions and, I think we used to have much more of a consensus of, you know, understanding what what it meant for a child to be safe, that sort of thing. Um, Is it just political polarization has created this, or are there other factors that have kind of led us to this point? This might be a better question for you. I I, I think part of it is like, look, we because of the way that we get our information now too, that sometimes smaller factions within the community get a larger share of the voice in that sense. I don't know that everybody believes we shouldn't have a system to the, vo- to the size of the, of the volume of that statement that's being made, right? If children are being injured and, and being hurt, physically abused, sexually abused, all this stuff, they need to be taken out of those homes. They need to be safe. I mean, that's really my belief on it. Um, you know, I certainly also believe that we could do more to, to combat poverty and well, so many other things too. But, um, you know, it's like the polling around this issue, and this is what I love about, honestly, what I love about AI and coming here is that it's all, like the people in these rooms that when we have them, I mean, half the time it's more Democrats than Republicans there too. And we all see eye to eye on this. It's not, there's, it's pretty simple for us to say, you know, this is, we need to do more. I'm not the policy person though, so I don't know the <laughs> answers. <laughs> um, I mean, related to that abolition discussion is a discussion of race. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how do you, how, I, you could tell us the race of the children who you fostered and adopted and, you know, yeah. how that plays into this. Is that just making it harder for us to have these realistic conversations about which, whether kids are safe or not? 
So, I, I mean, I think by and large, like this country has a terrible history in the way that we've treated black and indigenous people in particular and other communities of, you know, we're BIPOC communities, right? And so the, I think there's a natural distrust of government. When the government shows up at your door, you know, and you're indigenous, you're not going to want to open it. And I don't blame you. That's, I mean, that's just frankly part of it, right? But, and we look at the system today, indigenous youth are represented, but they make up 2% of the foster care population, but only 1% of the population as a whole. For black youth, it's 1.5%. And, you know, they make one and a half times their percentage of the population, of the general population. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a clear over-representation of that. You know, I think that really does speak to how we over-surveil communities of color in the country, in this country, you know? Um, so the the federal government just put out the child maltreatment 2022 report. Well, they put it up and then they took it down and they put it up again because <laughs> you know everything works so well in Washington these days. Um, but one of the one of the parts of the report, um, uh, which was which has been kind of consistent over the last number of years, is the over representation of uh, maltreatment victims among Black kids and Indigenous kids. Um, and particularly the overrepresentation among child maltreatment fatalities. Um, black kids are three and a half, I think it's the new report says black kids are three and a half times more likely to be victims of child maltreatment fatalities than white kids. Um, what, is the, what is the role of the system in sort of trying to, at the same time, you know, treat families equally, mm -hmm. but also think about how to um, address the problems that seem to be more prevalent in some families than others? I think the question is like, is it that the problem is more prevalent or that we're noticing it more because we're looking at those communities with a bigger magnifying glass, right? Like, I, I don't know the answer to this either. Like, so, you know. It, well, the fatalities, it's hard to sort of just say. Fatalities, like, is, yeah, I'm not. Call, it, it, yeah. Like, but I, but I, don't, I honestly don't know the, you know, I, I don't know enough about the policy on the back end of that to tell you, you know, what that is. I do, I think we we'll just have a... Um, Historic, you know, historically, we haven't been very fair in the way that we have gone after communities of color. Yeah. I wanted to talk for a minute about kind of that you had very young children, which is mm -hmm. quite typical of, you know, kids entering foster care. Um, it, there are people who think we should have kind of different, a different understanding of, um, you know, how to do foster care for younger kids, that leaving kids who, you know, say come in at three months, um, in the system for long periods of time is a different, you know, proposition than, you know, dealing with a 10-year-old who has like a long-term, mm -hmm. long-standing relationship with the biological parents and has attached to them. Um, you know, and, and I think California until recently had something where it was a little, you were supposed to sort of think about it a little bit differently for kids under the age of six. Do you have any thoughts about kind of um, particularly with your experience with infants and toddlers, like what it means for them to be going back to a family where, as you say, like the three-month-old probably didn't know his mother when he was sent back after 15 yeah. months? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I think it's, it's one of those things where like when we were in our class, our, our trainer said to us, if you wrote a book on foster care, it would be called It Depends because it depends on the situation. Every situation is different. Every foster parent is different. Every social worker is different. Every judge is different. Every you know biological parent is different. And I think that that's one of those things that just, you know, that there's just so much nuance to it. And I think that we're dealing with human lives and trauma is very easy to put onto somebody. And so I think it deserves the, the attention, the specialized attention to each case, you know, where we can, um, go in and say, like, what does make sense for this kid? I mean, is in our case, the, that baby didn't know who his mother was, by and large, right? But in other cases, there are parents who, you know, do weekly visits, and then they do, you know, every, every couple days they visit. There's, you know, I mean, it, it moves up and up and up. And so that is a different dynamic. And, you know, it, you just don't know until you get in there, you know? Um, so what are some of the things that you think could have been done differently by the system, should be done differently by the system. I mean, you know, you presumably, on the, on the one hand, I mean, look, the, the book is heartwarming and heartbreaking and, you know, I'm terrible at blurbs, but I mean, you should really, I, I mean, I don't know whether people walk away from this book thinking I want to foster or I could never imagine doing this, this experience was so horrible. 
Um, so I assume that you would like more people, as you said, to get involved and maybe if they feel, you know, called to do Mm -hmm. it to foster. Um, so, you know, what are the things that you think could encourage more people who are in your situation to consider this and to maybe make it a little bit more (laughs) user-friendly, let's just say? Well, first I would say that it's, it's not something that's for everybody and we don't need everybody to do it. Like, yes, there's a crisis level shortage in every community in this country, especially here in DC. And we desperately need people. That being said, it's not for everybody. And I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. Like, you know, read the book and you'll know why on, on that case, right? That being said, like, there, it also was, an, it is an incredible experience that we, you know, that we've had. And um, I think that there is a ladder of engagement for people, right? It's the people that can talk to their senator, the people that can, are much smarter than me, that can come up with the policies to solve what you're talking about. You know, and then I also think there's people that can become CASAs, you know, the court appointed special advocates who go in and advocate on behalf of a child in court and provide a voice for them. There's mentorships, you know, um, big brothers, big sisters. There's so many different programs. There's comfort cases that Rob Share right there created, which is an amazing organization. You know, when a child enters foster care, something's happened at the house. They show up at the house and say, here's a trash bag. Go get your stuff. We're leaving in five minutes. Like, what do you grab? Like, how awful is that? Well, Rob's organization changes that. So there's people who can support them. And there's, some, there's a way for all of us to have a touch point to help. But not everyone should foster. I mean, I don't, I truly believe that. And are there things that the system should be doing differently in terms of their ability, its ability to, to recruit and to support foster families? Yeah, I, I think that there are, you know, and there, you see these incremental things happen, right? I mean, this idea like in LA, it's, it, or in everywhere, the goal is to try to keep the kid in their school of origin, right? Let's not have as least amount of movements as you can. And so what they're trying to do now in, in Los Angeles is use like geo-targeting. So if a kid gets picked up in this community, what school do they have? Like, well, which houses do we have available there? And try to make, instead of like, just pick up the phone and, and like, you know, psycho dialing until somebody answers the phone, right? Like it's, it's like, okay, you got a bed. Can we take it? Okay, we got one coming in. It, it's, it shouldn't be that way. It should be matching a child with the right home, not a home. And so there's this, like but also like they have like a partnership with Hop, Skip, Drive where kids, it's basically like Uber with people who are licensed and stuff like that. So the kid can drive, get a ride across town to stay in their school of origin so that they're not completely uprooted. You know, it's like I said goodbye to my mother, my grandmother, my dog, and now I'm in a school you know, with a bunch of kids who don't look like me or don't speak my native language, you know. Is there anything that you wish you would have been told when you went to foster parent training? I wish I paid more attention. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. That's on you, you, Mark. (laughs) Yeah, that's totally, it's totally, well, I think I went in with baby fever, right? Like I was like, skip it in there, right? And so I thought we're going to get this slammed on case with this beautiful child. We're going to adopt it. It's going to be amazing. And then you know, the, the trainer, I mean, to her credit, she was just, you know, serving truth bombs left and right. Like, it was like, let's talk trauma. Let's talk abuse. Let's talk about, you know, adverse childhood experiences. What does it mean, you know? And it's, it's you, you pay attention, but you're also like, but, you know, I got this. Like, we, we can do, you know. Hmm. I wouldn't, I would still have done it. I don't want to, you know. All right, well, I've, I've asked all my questions, so I want to start. I know we have a lot of people here, and I'm very excited about that, and I want to open it up for questions. Um, so if you raise your hand, but you need to wait for the mic to come to you, um, and also you need to make sure that it is a question that you are asking. So if there is a question mark at the end of it, we'll be approved. <laughs> all right, right here. My experience with the foster care system goes back 35 years so I'm not sure how, what the situation is now, but that was in Virginia. And at the time, we were told, a group of us were told by state legislators that the statute, the objective of the statutes was reunification of the child with the parent. Mm-hmm. And that the uh, uh, welfare of the child was not at the top of the, pri- uh, the legislative priority. So I, I've heard that that's the same in other states, but I don't know if, the, if there's any way to get around that. To, what is the objective? Is it to keep a family united or to watch out for the child? So that's a hard, I mean, because funny, it, it, the goal is always reunifica- reunification, right? And, and frankly, it should be, right? No one should be in the business of trying to break apart families and take kids from people, right? 
And so this is, you know, one of the things that we all <laughs> agree on too. Like it's, you know, but it, but that being said, you know, one of the terms that came up, and actually I wanted it to be, the, it was the initial title of the book until my agent was like, no way. But it was minimum standard of care. And I was like, that just blew my mind. That they were like, oh, they need to be able to provide the minimum standard of care. And I'm like, who's minimum? You know, that's like neglect. What's neglect to you? What's it to you? What's it, it doesn't, it means something different to everybody. So that was, so minimum standard of care was like, well, we all have our own, floor for what that means. And I think that in, in so many cases, it's about, um, you know, it's reunification first is reunification first, but it really depends what judge you end up with and what, you know, what attorneys you get and what social workers you get, how that's handled. You know, sometimes the kid's best interest is put forward and sometimes, you know, it, it's not. I mean, it, in some states, even like the kids have the where it's like they might have an advocate for them, like older youth in particular, who's saying like, oh, they really want to go back to their mother or they really want to stay with a foster parent or who might be a kinship provider or something like that. And so the judge may say, well, it's probably in your best interest to go with the parent or I want to give you your wish and send you to your aunt or whoever it might be. First of all, Mark, I have to tell you, um, I've read the book and to me, as I told you before, it's a resource. Um, the thing I want to know, as a father, my husband and I, we have adopted five kids out of foster care. Um, our youngest came at six months. Our oldest came at the age of 18. Do you find, as a father who has adopted, that there's no resources after the adoption? Um, we notice that children who have the trauma, um, children that we have as they have grown up and the trauma mm -hmm. starts to come out during the teenage years, there's no support. Do you feel that needs to change? I think for us, we... Um I think it's a, it, it was available to, and again, we live in Los Angeles County, so like getting a therapist is like going to CVS. Like it's, I mean, they're everywhere, right? So like for us, we see, that being said, we had to like exaggerate about what was going on just to get it, you know, sped up and get on the list and those sort of things. So, you know, I think there was a couple things like that where we needed resources faster, you know, and so we just had to inflate the sense of need, you know, um, but for the most part, I mean, you know, we haven't had a tremendously trying time yet, although we're not teenagers yet. Our kids aren't, you know. <laughs> First of all, I'm so proud of you. Um, I know you mentioned in the book, like, a lot of parents that lose their children into the foster system probably have mental health issues or trauma, you know, stemming from their, their own upbringings. But do you feel like there's enough mental health support for the I know there's like drug, court ordered drug rehab and parenting classes that they have to do, but is mental health services part of their process of getting their kids back? And is there mental health services available for the kids who obviously go through the tra trauma of having to be put in the foster system and you know going back and forth for the, for the visitations for the older kids who know their parents and mm -hmm. then they're constantly being jerked? back and forth, do you think it's sufficient or it doesn't even exist? With the kids, it was interesting. You know, I, I think I've come to this sort of realization after, again, like when we had the three-month-old and 13-month-old, there wasn't therapists for them to talk to, right? Like they didn't, they were really spe speaking, right? Like in that sense. So you're, but what I realized is like, so they had three hours of visitation three times a week. Then we had doctor's appointments. Then we had the social worker who came once a week. The other one who comes once a month, we had whatever else going on. You know, I mean, there was so much stuff that we had to fit in that was required by the courts and required by the fact of just being foster parents. Therapy was, was optional. Like, we had to request it. We're like, well, what does a kid need most? So if you're, you know, I mean, for me, I was like, I would have canceled everything else just to bring them to therapy if that's where they, where they were. And of course, of course, like the kids we've adopted, immediately, like before they moved in, I had the therapist lined up. I was like, we're, we're, we're doing this, you know? Um, and it's been a priority, but I think that that's what drives us. And so we were able to advocate for it and get it. Um, also, I told them I'd put them in my book if they didn't. So, you know. <laughs> but as far as the birth parents, I have no idea. Like, I really don't know if there's um, where that is. I think you might be able to speak better to this than I am. Well, the court can mandate, you know, mental health services and. Uh, drug treatment and that sort of thing, and if it's not provided, then that means that you know the the they the the agency hasn't made reasonable efforts, which is sort of what's required by law, 
And then either the case will get continued or the kids will be reunified with the parents. But um, the agencies are required to provide these different services. A sort of bigger question sometimes is the effectiveness of some of the services. There's mm -hmm. not a lot of evidence-based programs um, that actually necessarily work. A lot of the parenting classes that you hear about, the anger management classes, there's just there's not a lot of yeah. evidence that they necessarily solve the problems that they're intended to solve. And then, you know, when you add to that, I mean, you know, everybody who knows somebody who's, you know, suffered from addiction knows that it's not as simple as we're going to enroll you in this 30-day program and then magically the problem is going to go away. So I think, you know, when it comes to child welfare, though, we're also, we're sort of very naive about how this problem gets fixed. Like, okay, we mandated treatment, you completed it, now you get your kids back. But there's a lot of stuff that happens after that, which is why, you know, I think, you know, what happened with, uh, you know, Mark's family, you know, is certainly not atypical, which is, you know, even if the mother has completed this drug treatment program, um, you know, the likelihood that things will go back to where they were either because of the drugs or because of the underlying mental health issues, you know, is is pretty significant. And it's it's odd that we kind of have this very realistic conversation in this country about drugs outside of child welfare, but not a very realistic conversation about drugs inside of the child welfare system. I see child welfare as a backstop. Like it's when everything else in society has failed a child, that's where they end up. And actually, and the next degree is probation, right? Like it's like this kid has been failed by every adult in their life, whether that's you know parents, guardians, caregivers, whoever it is, they've been failed by every system from the education system to the to the you know social services, you know, department of children and family services, and ultimately you know a kid joins a gang because they need a sense of belonging, they need safety, they need and so they join a gang, they commit a crime, they get arrested, they go on a probation, and they're in probation foster care, or they're trafficked because they needed you know the connection. There's there's so many different things that have happened to these kids that you know it, it's. It's horrific, and I think that foster care is really the backstop of where every child who's been failed ends up. The working group statement that we put out maybe like two years ago now, it was just called What Child Protection is For. Um, and in some ways, you know, child welfare has sort of had a lot of mission creep. Like it's mm -hmm. trying to sort of, um, you know, advocate for the well-being of every family in America or something like that. Um, but at the same time, I think sometimes it loses sight of its core mission, which is sort of being the ambulance, like which is yeah. the, the backstop because, you know, all these other systems have in one way or another failed or or even not systems have failed, just a family mm -hmm. has failed in some way. And, um, you know, and, and when you sort of say like we could do without this or, you know, uh, you, you kind of lose sight of the importance of the ambulance in the in the system. So. Yeah. Any questions? Hey, Mark. <clears throat> I'm also uh, extremely proud of you. you. Uh, feeling a little emotional. I've known Mark since high school. Now, Mar I know um, Mark has a big family. Is everyone here related to him? <laughs> Just this one. <laughs> so um, my question is focusing on when reunification is on the table versus when it isn't and how mm -hmm. that impacted your and Jason's approach, if at all, to parenting. So it's one thing if... You know, you know, you know that I guess slightly the odds are against you in terms of being able to go from foster to yeah. adopt, certainly in the first placement situation that you all had. But then it sounds like w with the kids that you ultimately adopted that it seemed like reunification was not on the table or was less likely to be on the table. So did you approach parenting differently in ways to, you know, kind of guard your heart, not get too close? Uh, if you could just speak a little bit to that, I'd be delighted to hear. And no, that's, that's a great question. I think the biggest thing, and I told myself this early on, was that with even with reunification on the table, it's like, it's not fair to these kids to not love them like they're never leaving me because they need to know their worth, they need to know they're loved, you know, and they're worthy of love. And I think that was, that's obviously what makes it so hard and so heartbreaking because you're, you know, you're setting yourself up for a broken heart if the child leaves, but that being said, it's like, I'd rather deal with my own broken heart than have a kid deal with feeling not worthy for the rest of their life. Yeah. Go. Hold on one sec. The microphone's coming. Thank you. This has really been really interesting. My question is, we, we've had a foster care for, I guess, several decades now, and before that, orphanages. Has there ever been a study, and this may be an AEI question, that tracked adults um, from 
either institution or both institutions to see how productive their lives are after this experience? Um, so it's very complicated, um, in part because uh, orphanages had a different population. So orphanages, um, typically, there's a, a great author, if you're interested in kind of the history of this, named Richard McKenzie, who's an economist at UC Irvine, and he himself grew up in an orphanage. I think he's over 80 now. Um, but um, when he was in an orphanage, um, you know, most of the kids there were there because, really, because of poverty. Like, their parents couldn't afford to raise them. Maybe the mother had died or something, and the father just didn't know what to do with the kids. And so a lot of the kids who went there had not experienced a lot of the kind of severe maltreatment that kids who are coming into the foster mm -hmm. care system today have experienced. So, you know, they wouldn't have been, you know, necessarily left in a bathtub alone, or they wouldn't mm -hmm. have had a parent who had severe mental health or drug issues. They certainly wouldn't have, you know, probably would not have been severely abused in any way, let alone sexually abused. And so, you know, the thing that we always have to keep in mind with the foster care system and measuring outcomes, which a lot of people like to do, is that you have to understand what the inputs are. And so when you have a child who's come in already having experienced a significant amount of maltreatment, however you want to define that, it's not surprising, no matter how loving and how compassionate and how great the foster parents are, that they are not able to fix all of those things that have gone wrong in that child's life. So, you know, everything from, you know, whether they get a high school degree to whether they manage to stay out of the criminal justice system, all of those things are impacted by the kind of maltreatment that they may have experienced at an early age. So if you look at the orphanages, and there are still a few left, although they're not typically called that, um, the, you know, the, this guy, Richard McKenzie, went to his, like, 50th reunion of, like, that's, people actually, you know, who went to the same one he had, like, you know, credit the institution with their success. And many of them were hugely successful. But you also, they also didn't experience a lot of the, the you know, severe maltreatment that kids today coming into the foster care system experience. I do want to say too, though, it's funny. You know, there is this. There, there's oftentimes a, a real negative stigma for kids in care that kids are in foster care, like they're damaged or they're broken or whatever. Like you hear these things, and it's like, you know, it's so not true. It's so many things. Not only because people are like, oh, kids are resilient, but it's like, you know, if you if you deal with PTSD, you can develop PTSG, like post-traumatic stress growth, right? It makes you more resilient. It makes you the person you want in a triage situation. Like it's, there's things like that that are, can be really beneficial to you as a human, right? But also things that we don't think about, like a child living in poverty means there's no car seat, which means that child's being held by a parent in a car. It means that when there is a drug deal going on in the living room, that child's being held in the other room by the other parent, right? Like there's things like that that are happening, but that means that they're getting skin-to-skin -skin contact. And so, yeah, they may have a little bit of fear at night when some stranger knocks on the door, but they're still having those other emotional ties that we need as a human to be able to connect to others later in life. And so there, I know that, like, what I'm trying to say is, like, it's not all bad and neglectful in some cases. Like, yes, you know, having a drug deal go on in the living room is probably not great for you as a child, but that being said, like, there's, there's other things that have worked out just by happenstance that you wouldn't have thought about, you know, the upside that come up in therapy years later. I just wanted to add one thing. So we were having this poverty and neglect conversation, and I do think, you know, everyone agrees there's a lot of confusion about what's meant there. I mean, and, and mm -hmm. I think, but, you know, whereas we could all agree, like, you know, leaving toddlers in a bathtub by themselves... You know, it, it would not, you know, no one would check off an abuse box, but clearly there's a clear danger there. Um, but our um, one of our friends who's also in this working group, Sarah Font, who's at um, Penn State, did a really interesting yeah. look at some longitudinal data in Wisconsin. And she looked at kids um, whose families were receiving, you know, payments, food stamp payments, or other kind of just cash welfare payments, um, and compared those with kids who had received those payments and also been reported for neglect. Yeah. Um, and this 
it wasn't even had didn't even have to be substantiated um which is to say like you know even if the the report happened but nobody found anything when they went out to investigate and so she compared these two groups of kids kids who were just impoverished and kids who experienced poverty and neglect and there were pretty significant differences uh for the kids who experienced neglect they did have lower rates of high school graduation um the girls were more likely to experience teen pregnancy there was a higher likelihood of involvement in the criminal justice system and all of these things were not because the kids were in foster care these were not kids in foster care these were kids again who someone just called or teacher called or doctor called and said i think there's neglect going on here so even though we don't necessarily have the perfect encapsulation mm-hmm. of what neglect is a lot of when we know it when we see it um there clearly is something going on yeah. in those homes that is detrimental to kids now what we should do about that is a, is another question but i think we're probably doing a lot of these kids a disservice by just saying that it's poverty because you know Agreed. as when the bathtub you know we know something is going wrong the, yeah and there's also like there's movements in states because there was there to lower numbers they're they're taking away neglect as an option so it used to be like you would have like a checklist of like what's wrong in the house like substance abuse this and that well if you have to substantiate what that is well i didn't see them you know shooting up so i can't really say that i know they're doing drugs but they're exhibiting every sign of someone who's on heroin or, you know, fentanyl whatever it might be. So, I'll just check the neglect as well because the house is a mess or whatever it is. So, 60% of the kids being detained were were neglect, but maybe whatever the other percentage was, you know, that was the highest box, but they also had multiple boxes checked there. And I I think that so some of the states have been started like Texas in particular has eliminated neglect as an option. But you see their their ranks are actually dropping down as a result of the numbers of kids going in is dropping. you know but they're taking away the biggest reason kids are detained right we don't know whether that's making them safer right yeah um any other questions all right good all right well please join us we're going to have a little reception for mark outside thank you all for coming and please give mark a round of applause